legal clouds and heat waves descend on the country. They're trying to intimidate people so that people make up lies about me. I did nothing wrong. Former President Trump's legal issues worsen after he's charged with more crimes in the classified documents probe. And his defense team meets with the Justice Department to try and hold off what could be an imminent second federal indictment for January 6th and election interference. Plus, is there any possibility that the president would end up pardoning his son? No. Hunter Biden's plea deal implodes, continuing the political fallout for President Biden. Then, help is here, and we're going to make it available to anyone who needs it. The nation broils under a punishing heat wave, increasing pressure on the president to do more to address climate change. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. I'm William Brangham. While the country suffers through a relentless heat wave, here on the East Coast, a flurry of legal developments has dialed up the temperature on the former president. Donald Trump's lawyers met on Thursday with special counsel Jack Smith's team, hoping to prevent a likely second federal indictment, this time related to Trump's alleged efforts to overturn his loss in the 2020 election. The former president is also facing new charges in the classified documents case. Late Thursday, the special counsel's office revised its initial indictment to include accusations that Trump sought to delete surveillance video from inside Mar-a-Lago to obstruct the Justice Department's probe. And for President Biden, his son's legal issues aren't going away as hoped. On Wednesday, Hunter Biden's plea deal on tax and gun charges was put on hold after a judge questioned the agreement's constitutionality and deferred the case. House Republicans who are already investigating that DOJ's plea deal applauded the judge's scrutiny. This all but guarantees that the questions over Hunter Biden will continue to plague the president as he ramps up his re-election bid. Joining me to discuss all of this and more, Peter Baker. He is the chief White House correspondent for The New York Times. And here with me in the studio, Devlin Barrett covers the Justice Department for The Washington Post. Leanne Caldwell is the anchor of Washington Post Live and co-author of the early 202 newsletter. And Anita Kumar is managing senior managing editor at Politico. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Devlin, to you first. Uh, we saw these new charges against the former president, just not in the case that we were expecting this week, but allegations that Trump tried to destroy surveillance video uh, and a few other charges. Tell us what we learned. So what we learned is that the prosecution case for obstruction and essentially a cover-up in this case is bigger than we previously knew. And it involves another Trump employee who allegedly set out at Trump's direction to try to destroy security camera footage, according to prosecutors. And that's a big deal because it shows a, a broader group of people engaged in more misconduct, alleged misconduct. And it's also important because it added additional charge against President Trump about this Iran plan of attack document that has generated so much interest, in part because he talked about how it was classified. This is more bad facts for the former president. Bad facts, that's the technical term for it. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, yeah, more bad facts and, and to be honest, a broader net uh, so one of the things that lawyers always tell you is the more people who are at the defense table, the worse it is for each of those people. You just saw another person added to the defense table this week, and that is an ominous sign for the defense. Tell us about that new person who was added, Carlos de Oliveira. So Carlos de Oliveira is a longtime Trump 
employee. Uh, he's an immigrant who first attracted Trump's notice and praise by working on the metal great work doors of the Mar-a-Lago. Uh, we have a bunch of new reporting about this this weekend. And what happened to Carlos de Oliveira is the FBI and the prosecutors and the special counsel spent a period of months trying to make him a, a witness in their case. And what they increasingly came up against was, in their minds, a lot of uh, bad memory, a lot of bad answers, and that all culminated, these, these increasingly testy exchanges and questions all culminated in an April session, we report, in which he was essentially had a queen for a day interview, which means you get a chance to mm -hmm. make your final pitch for why you might be considered a witness, and we're told he did not pass that test. And so now he has gone from essentially a failed witness to a defendant. Anita, this, I mean, separate from the alleged crime here, this, everything that Devlin is talking about really strengthens this sense that this was a, a cover-up. I can't remember what the old adage is about the crime being, or the cover-up is worse than the crime, whatever that is. Uh -huh. That seems to be very strengthened here. It does. The question is really, do Trump supporters care? And what we've seen after every single indictment and charge against him is that his supporters actually support him more. So if you look at the polls, Republicans are supporting him uh, more than they have. And it, it, he has small dollar donors. That's all still really going uh, really well for him. So the question is, you know, what is going to happen with if there's a third and you know this other federal indictment, uh, will that tip the scale? Because that's about January 6, which is an entirely different issue, which might uh, you know impact other people. And really, what do his opponents do? They've been very tepid so far, so they haven't been talking about this as much. Mostly, what we've been hearing is it's a distraction. You know, we should talk about Joe Biden. We shouldn't be talking about what's going on with Donald Trump. But they haven't really gone there yet. So. While obviously this is bad news for Donald Trump legally, and he has a lot to deal with, on the political front, he's just moving straight forward. Peter Baker, the, the, the point that Anita is making here, too, is the other indictment that we expected to see this week. This is the January 6th indictment, which is all about the alleged crimes that the president, the former president, might have done, along with his allies, to try to overturn his loss in the 2020 election. We've gotten some inkling of what those charges might be. Do you have any sense of how the DOJ is going to approach this? If they drop this indictment, how will they go after the former president? Yeah, it's a good question. This is the other shoe everybody expected to drop this week, and it didn't. The president's lawyers met with the Department of Justice officials, the special counsel's office, on Thursday morning to discuss this case, to discuss this possible indictment, and to make their best case, presumably, for why they didn't think their client, the former president, should be charged. Now, we'll see if that was persuasive. It's hard to imagine that it was. They did the same uh, routine right before the classified documents indictment. The next time the grand jury meets, normally they meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So the next time in theory they would meet would be this coming Tuesday if they haven't indicted him already under seal. That's another date when they could potentially indict him. Now, this is a really interesting uh, uh, point, though, because this indictment goes further than the two we've already seen. The, the one we've been talking about with regard to the classified documents and the state charges in New York about hush money paid to Stephanie uh, Clifford, who was the uh, Stormy Daniels, the, the uh, adult film actress. This goes to the heart of the matter. If we were to get an indictment involving January 6th, it's about overturning an election. It's about subverting, in effect, the constitutional process for changing power between one leader to another. That goes so much further than what we've already been talking about, as serious as classified documents are, as serious as hush money may be. Uh, this would go to the heart of the matter and would be such a different order of significance and consequence that we have to wait and see, of course, whether they go through with it and th then what the president's defense would be if he has one. Leon, to that point, Peter is describing, yes, this is a truly extraordinary indictment if it were to come for the alleged crimes here. Let's say it does drop. What do you think the president does? Does, does it change his defense at all if this indictment does come as we expect? Uh, it, it, Donald Trump's defense? Yes. I don't think so. I think that what is happening with Donald Trump is his political campaign is very closely intertwined with his legal effort as well. His people flat out tell you it is one and the same. The legal strategy and the political strategy are, are the same. Um, and so I don't think a lot changes. What I do 
think is unknown is if this January 6th indictment does hit a little bit differently with the American public. It might not hit differently. It probably won't hit differently with his base. But beyond that 35 percent of Americans who have diehard support for Donald Trump, where does this go? And then meanwhile, you have in the House of Representatives for the first time House Speaker Kevin McCarthy opening the door to a potential impeachment inquiry into President Biden. And so this is also a very political tactic to muddy the waters and to ensure that both perhaps front runners for the presidential election are involved in these investigations. Um, Devlin, on this, this question of Trump's defense, uh, I think contrary to the advice of every single defense attorney in America, the president, the former president, keeps talking publicly about this case. Yes, we just does. saw him again saying, these two guys named in the, in the Mar-a-Lago case, they're great employees, I love them, that's wonderful, I think they've been pressured to lie. Does, is there a greater potential that as the president keeps talking, the former president, that this puts him in more legal jeopardy? We're already seeing that play out in real time. So remember I mentioned that, that new count in the new indictment about the Iranian document? Mm -hmm. President Trump weeks ago said no such document exists. He came out and he just said that. And then, bam, not too long later, the, the government says not only does it exist, it's a new charge in your case. So he continues to talk in ways that would be for any defendant incredibly risky. And it's hard to expect that pattern to change just because, you know, he is his own chief legal counsel, for better or worse. Uh, Peter Baker, I wonder if, if as, as Leanne and Anita have touched on, do you think it's possible that these indictments could be a double-edged sword in the sense that the indictments might strengthen the, the former president's standing with his core base, while at the same time, making him increasingly politically radioactive to the independence that he might need to beat Joe Biden if he were to become the nominee. Yeah, that's exactly the worry most Republicans, many Republican strategists have right now, right, is that, in fact, he may be uh, unbeatable for the nomination. Certainly at the moment, he's a far, uh, far and away the front runner. But he is turning off uh, Democrats and independents he might need to win over, particularly in key battleground states in the Midwest and elsewhere, uh, to win the general election. And, and it, it's, it, we don't know, obviously. It has been remarkable to see a, a former president indicted not once but twice on serious charges and only increase in the polls within his own party. That's something we've never seen before. And so we're trying to make judgments based on, on a lack of any kind of historical precedent here. Uh, but so far, yeah, it has not been politically a problem for him. Now, his defense is a political defense. They're out to get me. It's persecution. It's a witch hunt, blah, blah, blah. What you notice if you look at his statements and what he says on TV is he doesn't deny the facts. He doesn't actually deny doing the things that they're charging him with doing. He's simply saying that they're either not illegal, nothing wrong with it, or that it's all politically motivated. He doesn't deny that he tried to, to, uh, to delete those tapes. He simply said that they didn't get deleted. He doesn't deny that he, uh, in fact, tried to keep these documents long after the authorities came and asked for him. He simply said he had the right to do it, or he didn't do it, or he makes some other version of the, of, 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 of the, of the reality here. And so his, his ability to, to change the narrative has been rather successful in, uh, among Republican voters. We'll see where that leads if it gets to a general election. Anita, you were touching on this before. You do believe that, that even if a January 6th indictment comes full guns blazing from the DOJ, that it really doesn't dent him with that core base, that this only, as Peter's saying, strengthens his hold on the potential I, nomination? I think, I mean, it's, as Peter said, it's really hard to tell because we've never been here. But I do think that we've seen four years of his presidency. We've seen years after, and we just haven't seen a dent, really. All these times, and you know, Peter and I covered the Trump White House together, all these times that we said, oh, this is really going to affect him. Surely this it will be it. never did. Not one time. And so, you know, I just have that to go on. Obviously, this is very different than some of those other things we saw during the presidency. These are charges. This is serious. But it just doesn't seem to, to look that way. So we don't know. I think there's a couple things that could impact it. One, first of all, January 6th. Serious charges, fundamental to our democracy. The other thing is, the timing of this. Are we going to actually see trials before the 2024 election? And if so, we're going to hear all sorts of things. We're going to see, you know, all sorts of people come forward and talk. That may change something. It will for a lot of 
uh, Americans possibly don't know about that core base, though. I want to pivot to Hunter Biden and what happened with him this week. And Devlin, I'm going to turn to you again as our resident legal expert here. Hunter Biden and his legal team thought they were going to have a very boring hearing this week, and it did not turn out to be that way. What happened there? So what happened is something that, in fact, happens a fair bit in the federal court system, which is prosecutors and defense lawyers cut deals, and sometimes there's parts of those deals that are tricky and they really don't want to spell out too clearly, and a good judge will kick the tires, and good lawyers will have good answers to the judge's questions. What you saw this week was the lawyers did not have good answers to the judge's questions. And, and the problem is there are too many vague parts of this deal, and the judge said basically, look, you guys got to go back and work on this some more because I don't even understand what I'm approving right here. That's not a great look for the Justice Department, for Hunter Biden, um, but again, most of these issues get resolved along the way. This is just taking like everything to do with the Hunter Biden case. This is just taking even more time than it normally should. And Leanne, we know that certainly this is not going to tamp down any of the House GOP's investigations into Hunter Biden, the allegations that this is a two-tier justice system. With regard to Hunter Biden, though, we did also see another revelation that just happened today. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so tonight, for the first time, uh, President Biden acknowledged that he has a seventh grandchild. Um, that seventh grandchild is the illegitimate child of illegitimate, I should say, uh, with um, uh, of Hunter Biden's. And the reason this became an issue, there was a paternity case, there was a big legal case that just finished up. Um, and Hunter Biden had originally denied this grandchild, it turns out, or this child. It turns out, of course, it is his. Um, but the reason it became an issue as well is because President Biden, after this case finished just a couple of weeks ago, said he, love, he loves all of his six grandchildren, and he left out this seventh, this child of, of Hunter Biden's. And, you know, the, he got... Joe Biden got a lot of criticism for that, including in the columns of the New York Times where Maureen Dowd wrote, this might be the one Hunter Biden scandal that people care about. Mm. And now we have seen Hunter Biden or Joe Biden for the very first time acknowledge that he does have this seventh grandchild. Um, he, they broke it to People magazine. And so you can absolutely see where their audience is, is audience is people who Maureen Dowd was talking about, the mothers, the families, people who this can, they, they can emotionally connect with. Okay, we are going to leave that section for here. I know, Devlin, we have to say goodbye to you. Thank you so much for your insight and for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. This week, all of Washington was alarmed when Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell seemed to freeze up mid-sentence and just stood there. After nearly 20 seconds, he was helped away from the podium by his colleagues. The 81-year-old senator later came back, said he was fine, and has continued to do his work. But questions now linger over the future of one of the most influential Republicans in the nation's capital. And as this relentless heat wave continues its journey across the country, it is also increasing calls for President Biden to do more to address one of its underlying causes, climate change. Um, Peter Baker, uh, to you first about um, Mitch McConnell. Again, this was just a, such a striking thing for an in, a figure in Washington politics for as long as he has been, for it to be such an influential figure. He says he's going to continue his term and there is no changes in leadership, but it sounds like the Republicans are concerned about this. What is your sense? Yeah, I mean, look, Mitch McConnell has been a giant in Washington now for many years, uh, and he has been one of the most successful party leaders we've seen in a long time in the Senate. So to see him so, uh, you know, weakened in this way, I think, has been striking and, 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 and disturbing for a lot of his friends, as well as for some of his rivals. Uh, he, of course, had a fall in March, I believe it was, in which he uh, tripped and broke, uh, I think, uh, he, he, sorry, he got a concussion and he was out for six weeks. Apparently, he's now, uh, we're told he had a couple other falls and we didn't know about. Uh, they use a wheelchair when he goes to the airport to try to get him through uh, to the plane because that's the, the, the best way to go forward. So it reinforces that at 81, he is having troubles that a lot of 81-year-olds would have. And this is something we've seen now repeatedly in the last year or so in Washington. Diane Feinstein, the Democratic senator from, from California, and of course, the big issue, the big controversy not controversy, but the debate, I would say, over President Biden wanting another term 
he himself is 80 right now and hasn't had moments of confusion or, uh, you know, tripping over his memory or something like that. Polls show that's been a big concern for President Biden. So the person other than Mitch McConnell and his supporters who's unhappy about this this week would be probably President Biden in the White House. We would just assume this issue not be front and center. But it reminds us that, you know, our leaders are, in fact, human. They do get older. And the question is, at what point uh, is it right for them to step aside and when can they continue to do their jobs? Um, Anita, in Politico, you all reported uh, just recently that the White House has been watching McConnell in this regard and that concerns over his leadership, because it used to be the stereotype was that he was the arch villain for Democrats, the guy who denied Merrick Garland a seat on the Supreme Court. But now, as Politico has been reporting, that he has been seen in some ways as a check on the more rambunctious McCarthy House. And I wonder what your sense is as how Democrats might be thinking about negotiations going forward. Yeah, I mean, that's right. And remember, uh, Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell have a long, long, decades-long history. So uh, you don't really hear them. They, they might have a, a couple funny lines about each other, but you don't really hear them out and out criticizing each other because there is that long history. And remember, Joe Biden's the guy who says, look, I, you know, he, he can get along without anyone. He can cut deals. Uh, it's actually made some people in his party not very happy at some times. Um, so, you know, we, we do see that. I mean, there are definitely people that in the Democratic Party, they do feel like he's the villain, right? I don't think they're going to get that from the White House, but they are feeling that. They are thinking that. You have people in Mitch McConnell's own party uh, thinking, you know, sort of looking at their watch. Is this the time? They're not saying that out loud yet, but people are sort of talking about it and whispering it. I think uh, this week a lot of people were buzzing about this, but they don't want to say it out loud. Um, that's just not the place yet because it's he has been around for so, so very long. And Leanne, please go ahead. I was ahead. just going to say, and he has such a grip on his party. There's been, he had the biggest, cha closest challenge he had um, to his leadership this year when 13 Republicans voted that he should not be the leader. But, uh, but beyond that, he has, like I said, such a grip on his party and no one, it's interesting, I was talking to a Republican source on Monday and I asked about McConnell's health. And this, this is prior. This, to this is event. prior to this. What people are saying, what people are talking about. We know he had the head injury, and this source said no one talks about it. He, they think his mind is still very strong. No one talks about his age or him getting older. And then this incident happened. People started talking about it a little bit more, but still, no one is willing to come out and challenge him. And uh, his team reminds us that. He has had a long history of falls. He is a polio survivor. He fractured his shoulder in 2019 by falling on his porch. And so they are saying they are also trying to reinforce that he is mentally completely there. He just has always had physical challenges. Uh, Peter Baker, I want to turn lastly to this issue of that we are all experiencing, at least currently almost half the country living under these, these uh, just stupendous heat waves. These have re-again brought up this push to press Biden, even though he has already passed some substantive legislation to address climate change, to do more. And I wonder if you think that this kind of a calamity that we are living through with, with uh, electrical grids being taxed all over the country and people literally sweltering, if this does really dial up the pressure on the president and what he might do with that. Yeah, that's a really good question because, of course, you're right. He did pass $350 billion worth of uh, climate action last year as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, the largest expenditure on climate issues uh, in our history. Uh, and yet that doesn't necessarily mean that that's enough, right? A lot of climate activists would say, fine, good start, keep going. That's Don't sit there and, uh, and count, your, uh, count your laurels at this point. The question is whether the heat wave we're seeing, the kind of climate uh, impacts we're seeing right now uh, change the political dynamic at home, right? Does that build a larger, more uh, broad-based consensus among everyday people who can now look outside and see the impact of climate change on their own lives? They can't send their kids to camp. Uh, you know, their air conditions may break, in which case they, they don't know what to do at night with their, their families, you know, that they work is more complicated because of because of the heat and if, if this impacts their lives and they associate with climate change does that mean that the political environment changes over time now there are a lot of people who say look this is just weather weather happens it's not uh, you know a sign of anything all that big 
The question is whether or not the arguments that climate activists have been making get through in a moment like this when people see it in their everyday lives. Um, Leanne, in the last 30 seconds we have, is your sense that this moves the needle, especially with Republicans who have basically shown a good deal of intransigence on any climate action? Not really, no. They're still in all of the above energy uh, policy as far as Republicans are concerned, even the White House too, but they really are intent on ensuring that fossil fuels remain a central part of our energy sector. There are outliers within the Republican Party, but not really. We haven't seen a major shift yet. All right, I think we are gonna to have to leave it there for tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us and for Peter for joining us remotely. And thanks to all of you for joining us as well. I'm William Brangham, good night from Washington, D.C. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by for 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.